And here we're going to be talking about the, uh, the California's experience with the Affordable Care Act. So our board chairman, uh, John Gunn, just asked us about, we need to hear more about Obamacare, and we're certainly going to hear more about it in this, this session right now coming up. Uh, we have, in contrast to the first two sessions, we're going to have two panelists in this session. Uh, and uh, the first is John Burtko, who's currently the chief actuary and the director of research at Covered California, which is our state's health insurance exchange. Uh, prior to this, he served as the director of special initiatives and pricing in the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight at CMS. Uh, for many years, he had served as the chief actuary for Humana Inc. And then he followed that with positions at Rand and Brookings and our Center for Health Policy here at Stanford, although I may have the timing off a bit, but I think I've got it pretty right. Um, and there are currently uh, between one and two million Californians, I think, John, enrolled in Covered California. And he's going to tell us more about this because he understands better than perhaps anyone how the exchange has been performing and what uh, challenges lie on the horizon. John uh, was educated at Case Western Reserve University. And one fun fact about John is that uh, he is the proud father of Liz Burtko, who, oh, I'm sorry, Kate. I thought, OK, Kate, sorry. Kate Burko, that's, I, that's inexcusable. Kate Burko, who in two months will be representing the United States in Rio as an Olympian on our rowing team. So we, uh, we <laughs> so it was fun to learn of that. We actually learned of that from the person who does the CEPR Twitter uh, uh, feed. Uh, she uh, heard that John was coming to present and said, I know his daughter. She's amazing. And uh, she is a rower and hopes to achieve the kind of heights that, that, that Kate will be achieving. Uh, our, net, our second panelist for this session is here at Stanford, Professor Jay Bhattacharya. And Jay has not one, not two, not three, but four degrees from Stanford, bachelor's, master's, MD, and PhD. Uh, and he is now on his, in his 15th year at our School of Medicine. So Jay has spent much more than half of his life here at Stanford. Uh, and he has published dozens and dozens of articles in peer-reviewed outlets, and also has a page turner of a textbook called Health Economics. I actually just met with one of my Econ 1 students yesterday, who's graduating in, next month and is going out to work in the healthcare sector. And she said, what book should I, what, what things should I read to get me up to speed on sort of how health insurance works and how healthcare sector works? And I said, Number one on the list was Jay's textbook. So I think you got at least uh, one purchase there. Uh, uh, and so uh, he served in many roles as an expert at the National Institutes of Health and other agencies. And he's testified multiple times here in California and in Washington, DC about his research. He has advised many graduate and undergraduate students over the years. And his research has been funded uh, by numerous government agencies and private foundations. He's done hugely important and policy relevant research on many aspects of our healthcare and health insurance systems. And I am uh, very happy that he is a senior fellow here at CEPR and to have him here as a colleague at Stanford as well. So please join me in welcoming John Burtko and Jay Bhattacharya. So Mark, thanks for the introduction. And I will say uh, we, I have a relatively uncommon last name, you know, those Slavic people in Eastern Europe. Um, but if you Google Burtko, you will get at least 10, maybe 100 times as many mentions of Kate and her successes than of my little occasional uh, uh, bits in front of people like yourselves. Um, so I also want to do, say thanks. We, uh, I feel as an actuary, we work with economists a lot. Uh, Tom McCurdy, who is another person here at Stanford, and I have worked very closely together on some of the Obamacare type of things. Uh, we, we, count, we put together with the great help of his team at at his company, uh, the actuarial value calculator. None of you ever want to know about that unless you've got a case of insomnia. Um, so let me run through a couple of slides to talk about this and clearly open for any kind of questions. When Mark said I worked at Societal, what that means is I helped write the actuarial regulations for Obamacare for three years back there. And it, it, was, it was quite the struggle. I, I described it as having an actuarial puzzle to work on every day. Some of the puzzles took an hour, some took a month, some took a year. But we, uh, we managed to crank it out and get it working. Um, those of you who don't know, this is just quick. I'm not going to go through all of these. But uh, uh, you can hardly imagine in today's atmosphere that uh, the Affordable Care Act would ever be passed again. It is a uh, signature uh, 
uh, enactment that is comparable in many ways to Medicare back in 65. So what's the recap, though? The, uh, at least in this portion of the market, uh, the things that Amir talked about were mostly the, uh, well, call employer-sponsored insurance market. Uh, Optum does a tremendous amount of work with self-insured employers, with large employers, and uh, maybe took a pratfall on the individual market. I won't say more than that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, so this is where the individual market changed so much. Guaranteed issue from declining a lot of people uh, at one time pre-ACA. Uh, perhaps 30% of people who applied to get insurance were either declined outright or had pre-existing condition limitations or had to pay more because of that. That's now illegal. Um, many of you will, or at least in the audience, will go off and become entrepreneurs. And you find out after you go over the age of 26 and leave your parents uh, in folds on uh, health care coverage, you need to get coverage somewhere. Trust me. Come to Covered California, at least if you're in the state. We'll cover you, we promise. <laughs> uh, age rating change, that was supposedly a big deal. It's not, actually. That three to one is only slightly reduced from about four and a half to one. But there's a bigger change that no one else ever talks about. We went to unisex. Women under 40 are twice as expensive as men, for the obvious reason. They have kids. Men don't get more expensive until about age 57. And then, you know, they start falling over with heart conditions and such. Um, but in any case, this was a big change in the industry model. Um, I'll go on now to talk more about Covered California and what we do. So in the country, there are uh, 16 state-based or federally, uh, federal partnership model uh, marketplaces. Um, we and about five others were pretty successful, um, and I'll just point you north for a minute, in Oregon being overly ambitious and absolutely choosing the wrong partner fell flat on its face. And you know, places as diverse as Massachusetts, who had one up and running, chose the wrong, wrong uh, partner to do the IT. Uh, and uh, you know, everybody talks about four-letter words that you never say in public. Well, the three-letter acronym CGI shall never <laughs> come into the state if I can help it. <laughs> um, we are an active purchaser. That's opposed to the federal market, which basically takes all comers. So we've said, <clears throat> we're going to choose who comes to play. And our deal in 2014 was, if you guys come in, are prepared, and work hard, we're going to actually give you a bonus by uh, not allowing a lot of other people in to start with. So California's in the enviable role is we're a huge market. So lots of characters want to come in, um, but if you weren't going to play, you didn't get to come in for a couple of years, and we are maintaining that provision. We will allow new players in where we need them, not where they want to come. I mean, we've got eight plans in the two LA regions. We've got four in San Francisco. Um, I'll leave it to all you eco behavioral eco economists in the audience to know where does confusion start. But my uh, answer is it starts at about four to five plans. And, uh, uh, and uh, my boss, Peter Lee, sometimes talks about the tale of three cities, Los Angeles, Denver, and Miami. <coughs> Los Angeles has about 16 plans to, to uh, choose from because we've got uh, eight players, we got tiers and we have two kinds of plans. We have standardized plan designs because we think that makes it easy. You get to Denver and they've got about 45 and I think you get to Miami and you got about 80 plans to choose from. Uh, 80 is not real choice. You can't do that sorting. And as much as Amir might have talked about the tools that United has, nobody has tools that help you select that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complex than buying an airline ticket where you know hopefully, what your destination is. Um, as an active purchaser, we conduct plan negotiations. So uh, the federal model is kind of odd in the sense that it doesn't have any power in the ACA to negotiate with providers. That's left to uh, the state departments of insurance in most states. Here, we do negotiations and then work hand in hand with our two regulators to be sure we've gotten a good deal. And uh, you know, I will tell you this, rates that could look like they are supportable aren't necessarily good value. 
and we try to squeeze value out of that. I believe that all of our plans need to be profitable. It's just what's the right level of profits for that. Um, and then lastly, and as importantly, we are moving forward on quality initiatives. Um, you know, the, your first speaker who I just heard the end of was talking about some of that. There's a lot of places to improve quality in healthcare delivery in California. So what's the, our insurance market look like? Um, we have uh, 12 plans at the moment. We have the big four, which have about 90% of membership. Uh, HealthNet, Blue Shield, Anthem Blue Cross, and Kaiser. But as importantly, in some regions, we have competing local plans. Uh, one of my favorites is Chinese Community Health Plan in San Francisco. They do a great job competing against the big four. Uh, Sharp, down in the San Diego region, does a really good job as an integrated hospital delivery system competing against the folks down there. They help us by that competition of keeping the big guys uh, from uh, getting, uh, let's say, unnecessary profits and low service and quality. So, uh, you know, this all <clears throat> works together. And believe me, uh, Mark uh, suggested or re reminded you that I worked as the chief actuary for Humana for eight years. Uh, I know how to make money. I know how to be a capitalist. At the same time, it's important that we deliver value to people. Who are our customers? That roughly million and a half who enrolled and haven't all paid premiums this year are coming to us because they are the lower, in end of the, lower income end of the spectrum from 138% of FPL federal poverty level, which is uh, $15,000, up to 400%. 87% of our members are qualifier subsidies, so they're under that 400% FPL level. Um, what other kinds of things? I mentioned some of the, our smaller plans across there, but we had a couple of new entrants in 2016. United Healthcare was one of them. We needed uh, more competition in a couple of our regions, and then we let Oscar in. Uh, Oscar has a great story, high tech, et cetera. And the question was, would they bring something? And in particular, one of the demographic groups that we haven't been as successful on are young male millennials. Um, sad to say, in the two regions, they have only been very modestly successful. So we are hoping that uh, that will outlast them. They apparently are improving in their financial status, but they're definitely in the startup category. Um, a little bit more on what does the uh, landscape look like. Uh, you know, the, uh, all of you know the uh, things about uh, uh, the uh, healthcare.gov, and Amir, your company did do some helping, but it wasn't your guys who fixed it. It was the guy from Google who partnered up with the guy from Microsoft who brought in four or five other software engineers who turned it around in two weeks. And Stephen Brill has a great book describing this. Um, so, covered California 2015, we had a good year, but people began looking at us and saying, you know, you guys got 1.2, 1.3 million people in 2014, why didn't you grow some more? Well, we turned over 500,000 people. That means they came and went, we grew about 1%. Uh, Peter Lee, my boss, says, you need to think of covered California less like Medicaid or Medicare and more like a way station. People run off of their parents' coverage, they need coverage. People come off of jobs and they need coverage. Uh, people my age became, I'm an independent contractor to uh, Covered California, and before I became a Medicare senior, I needed to get coverage. My wife is on a, uh, a policy that is uh, in this individual market. Um, 2016, open enrollment results were about the same, a little bit more growth, but again, about 40% churn, which is our word for that turnover of people coming and going. And in addition to the ones I mentioned, I forgot to say, people come up out of Medi-Cal, we got two things happening. We got a booming economy, and we now have a legislated $15 wage. What's that gonna do for us in the future? People are gonna make more than the qualification for the 138% of FPL for Medicaid. Um, our results to date have been pretty good. A 4.2% average increase in 2015, a 4.0% average increase in 2016, and it's going to be more complicated in, for 2017 because we have the ending of one of the uh, 
uh, three, three R's. The reinsurance program will go away. For us, we were profitable enough that uh, risk orders didn't really apply to plans in California. Okay, I'm about ready to stop, and luckily, Amir did much of this. What are the problems? Cost, cost, and cost. So you got them everywhere. Um, but this is the very cost variation slide. Uh, I threw this up there just to say, where should we work first? And here I'm going to throw a challenge. I mean, I know I'm in an audience of really bright people. Specialty drugs is not only the problem that Amir referred to, it is a BFD problem. And my challenge to you is patent law and other things that the big pharma does have turned the specialty drugs in particular into a default uh, monopoly. So how do we price regulate or manage a, a, a monopoly? Uh, you know, you remember the railroad barons of the 19th century and what had to happen then? What are the solutions for now? So anybody that comes up with a solution, write to me and I will get you a covered California grant to think it through. But it's got to make sense and it's got to be workable under the next administration. Great. Thanks. So um, it's, I think this says a lot about the circles I walk in. Uh, John Burko is, 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 is ridiculously famous, and I, this is the first time I've heard of Kate, so I don't know. I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> you, you hang out in the wrong place. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> that, that might be the case. Uh, so, I'm gonna, so John focused on the, the, uh, the, the exchanges. Uh, if you look at the Affordable Care Act, there's the two major mechanisms by which insurance expansion happened. And John focused on the one, the one, the one part, the, the insurance exchanges. These tend to be for people that are over 138% of the poverty line. Uh, the other part of the, of the expansion of, Medi of, of, uh, of uh, uh, insurance coverage under the Affordable Care Act is Medicaid. And that tends to be for people that are under 138% of the poverty line, so for the, for the poor. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the key expansion idea behind Medicaid it, it, uh, for the Affordable Care Act is that it started allowing people to qualify for Medicaid. So yeah, so it's 138% of the poverty line. So people that, that used to be, you had to be a single mom or you had to have some other medical condition to qualify for Medicaid. And now you can qualify for Medicaid just if you earn 138% of the poverty line. The only thing they look at is, is, uh, is, is, is your income. Uh, okay, so I have sort of two major objectives in this, is, is just to recount what, what the ACA did to Medicaid. I sort of already did this, but I'm gonna give you some numbers. Uh, and then I'm going to present the results of a study that, uh, that some, some, uh, some uh, Stanford undergrads and I took that did right around the time of the expansion. We'll, we'll call, and, uh, and in fact, uh, one of the authors of the study is Shannon Shu, is in the room, uh, room today. So, okay. So let me, let me, let me tell you about the, uh, about the Medicaid expansion, some of the controversy around it, and then, then you can get some sense of where we are. Uh, so the, 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 probably the most famous case regarding, the Supreme Court case regarding the, the Affordable Care Act surrounded uh, the, uh, whether or not the ACA violated the Commerce Clause. That got all the press. But in that same decision, the, the Supreme Court ruled that the states could each decide on their own whether to expand Medicaid in the way I described. So states could say, no, no, we, we're going to keep the old Medicaid system. We're only going to allow single moms, poor single moms and people who have medical conditions that qualify to, to, to qualify for Medicaid. We won't just move to the income-only system. And in fact, what's happened is about 31 states have decided to expand Medicaid according to the Affordable Care Act, and, about, and, the, and the remainder, and I, 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 my rule is never subtract in public, so 50 minus 31 um, have, de have, have decided not to, uh, no, what's that, 19? That's 19, yeah. Um, have decided not to, uh, not to expand. Um, and you can see, the, the, in particular, that's, it's interesting for, for what I'm going to show you in a bit, is that California expanded and Texas did not. So in Texas, basically, they have the same uh, Medicaid system that they had before the Affordable Care Act came in place. California has this uh, has, has has expanded to include all people who are under. under um. Okay, uh, here are just just people don't know what the poverty line is. So I, I I put this graph up just to give some some sense of what the poverty line is. Uh, so for instance, if you are a household of one, uh, this is from 2013. It's gone up a, t a slight slight bit. If you're a household of one uh, and you make less than fifteen thousand eight hundred dollars, you're you are uh, qualify for Medicaid. Under, under this expansion. Uh, if you have a family of four, you can make up to 32,500 and still qualify for Medicaid. Um, the, 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 above that was John's, John's job to explain. Uh, basically, the idea is that uh, if you, you qualify for subsidies if you're between 138% of the poverty line and 400% of the poverty line. Um, and so you can, so, so for instance, a family of four making up to $94,000, 
could qualify for subsidies for the exchanges, but of course they wouldn't qualify for Medicaid in the way that I'm, I've, I've been talking about. Uh, now, let me tell you about another very little known feature of the Affordable Care Act that's going to play into my story. The, 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 the law increased payments for primary care for Medicaid, but because of budget reasons, they wanted to keep the, 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 the scoring of the bill below a certain threshold, um, they only did it for two years. So for two years, Medicaid, primary care Medicaid providers received payments at the same rates as, say, Medicare providers received. That was in 2013, and then, and then it ended in 2014. The Medicaid expansion I've been talking to you about expanded exactly in 2014, just as the, the payment rates dropped back down to the old levels. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to be careful here because there's some of my some of my uh, my econ professors are, are from, from from the old days are in the room uh, stuff from whom I learned economics. So I'm going to try to do economics in in public on the fly. Um, so you have this huge expansion. I'm going to show you some numbers in a bit in the number of people qualifying for Medicaid. At the same time, payment rates for suppliers went down. What do we expect to happen? Um, so the idea that I had uh, that was to test is is that. It's, it seems like there's going to be lots of people with Medicaid cards floating around looking for providers and not being able to find them in places that did the expansion. And I think that's, that's unfortunately, is what has happened. That's a major challenge I think I want to, I want to highlight. So here's, here's, the, uh, here's the data. Uh, here's the, here are the states that, that didn't increase the payment rates after the 2014 drop. So the yellow means that, that all those states increased payments before 2014, because of the Affordable Care Act, then in 2014, uh, with the Affordable Care Act, dropped payments to Medicaid providers. So California, for instance, didn't expand Medicaid payments at 2014, neither did Texas. Um, okay. So they, in fact, what they saw was a big decrease in payments to Medicaid providers exactly at the time you saw this expansion in Medicaid. Uh, now, now let me show you some numbers from, from California. Uh, so. Uh, Mark mentioned that a third of Californians are on Medicaid. That is true, but it's not, tr it's not all the Affordable Care Act. A lot of it is that there are other people who would have qualified for Medicaid even before, in the old days. Um, and so you get, uh, you, you get a, you get a pretty, pretty, substan pretty substantial increase right around 2014 in the number of people who, uh, who are on Medicaid. This is the, this is the Medicaid caseload. Here's, here's just, to just to give you some sense of the numbers, in 2014, uh, the, uh, about 2.6 million people in California signed up for Medicaid that wouldn't have signed up under the old law. In 2015, that's went up to 3.3 million, and the projection for next year is about 3. Point, again, 3.3 million. So we think we think about 3 million out of the 13 million people who are who are, uh, are on Medicaid. So 13 million out of about 34 million people in California, 35 million, uh, are on Medicaid. About three or four million of three three million of those three million to 13 million. Are, are there on Medicaid because of the Affordable Care Act. They have insurance because of the Affordable Care Act. That's good news, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, and it's a much bigger increase relative to the rest of the country. So California is expecting about, a, has had a 56% increase in, in coverage of Medicaid, whereas the other rest of the country, among the states that expanded, had about a 26% increase. Um, they're a very, very big increase. And uh, this has led to all kinds of headlines about, uh, about this expansion causing all kinds of costs, uh, you know, sort of problems with costs. Okay, so let me, let me, I'm not going to focus so much on cost. Let me tell you about Texas. Texas didn't expand. And they're having the same problems that all the states that didn't expand, that, that, that people had before the ACA in terms of access to care. So, uh, so for instance, the, the Medicaid in, in Texas actually declined. Went from 6.2% of the population to about 5.4% of the population. Um, uh, the percent uninsured uh, really focused on the poor. So in Medicaid, in about half the uninsured in, in, in Texas are on Medicaid, or, or, or would have qualified for Medicaid under the ACA had they expanded. Um, and so here's the income distribution among adults insured. So among the uninsured in Texas, about 40% are below 100% of the poverty line. And um, of course, if they, Texas had expanded, all these people would be on Medicaid instead of being uninsured. So it's a big deal. The fact that Texas made a decision not to expand, whereas California did, you, get, you see a very, very, a real effect on a lot of people who have no insurance coverage, that continue to have no insurance coverage. Okay, uh, and uh, so what are the consequences of that? A lot of folks without usual, usual sources of care, so a regular doctor that, that they can go see, uh, and uh, lots of postponed care, potentially. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's the good news for the ACA. The ACA, in many ways, addressed 
that exact problem. It, it gave people who previously didn't have insurance some access to insurance. This through, through, and, and as you saw, a large part of that is Medicaid. But what did it do to the market for Medicaid? And in particular, what did it do to the experiences of real people on the market? So let me describe this study. So here's what we did. So I, I, uh, I, 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 have, uh, I have some very, very bright students. And um, they, one of, a couple of them came up to me and said, we're interested in, this, in, in, uh, in, in trying to study this market, this Medicaid market. So here's what I proposed. I said, we should, uh, we should call a random sample of providers before the ACA expands in 2013, December, November, December 2013, call a random sample of providers after, and then, but not just call them. Let's just try to, let's try to get an appointment. Let's, so what you should do is you, you got, the students will go, will, will, called up these providers. We got a, a, a random sample of providers in California and Texas, and they called them up pretending to be patients. So, so one, one, group, one time they pretended to be a 25-year-old, I wanted a primary care, want, care appointment. And the other time they pretended to have a dad, because you know, they're thinking of me, I guess. Um, and they were going to be, they were going to, they're, they're gonna, they said, my dad has, is, has lung problems. They, this, you know, and if they're pressed, if they see you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And um, I'd like to, uh, he's just qualified for Medicaid, and I'd like to, to start a, a, at a, uh, I'd like to get an appointment for him. The reason they had to pretend to have a dad that did this, because you know, if you listen to undergrads, their voices don't sound like mine. So it's just this. Um, and, and in fact, there are a couple of them were calling from, uh, a couple of my, my students were, 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 they did this over Christmas break. So just think 100 hours over Christmas break making, make, making calls to pretend. So, and they were they, actually a couple of them from Singapore. So they're, they're calling at 3 in the morning uh, to, get, to get appointments over here. If they, if they got an appointment, they recorded it, and then, and then, and then, but then said, oh, no, it turns out I can't come, or he can't come. Um, if, they, if they didn't get an appointment, then they recorded that as well. So the question is, what fraction of the people in California Medicaid, uh, a top four fraction of times could they not get an appointment? Right? That's a good measure of are, 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 these, are these practices overburdened? Right? So I'm, this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move, uh, move fast because I just explained all of this to you. Um, okay, so yeah, so the, the dates are, are 2013, 2014. And the nice thing about this is Texas is a fantastic control state. They didn't expand Medicaid, right? They have the same old system. Uh, California did expand Medicaid. Uh, and in both states, you saw the big decline in prices paid to Medicaid providers at exactly the same time. Um, Okay, so here's what you see. So uh, this is Texas, and uh, the dark lines are frail, and the, uh, and the, the frail meaning that, 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 that they're pretending to have COPD, the, the dad's having COPD, and then uh, the, the, the light lines are young, young you know, so young, healthy person looking for a primary care visit. And what you see is that, in, let's just focus on the light lines for just a bit. In, in Texas, there's basically no change in the days until the next appointment. You could get call up, and within two weeks you can get an appointment in Texas. Uh, now, there was a slight increase in the post period for the frail, um, which I think is due to the drop in primary care prices in Texas. Um, California is a dramatic, much, much more dramatic increase in wait times. So what, it went from before, let's just, again, let's just focus on the young. And it went from about uh, 12 days to about 18 days. For the frail, it went from about 7 days to about, uh, about 17 days. Now, that's not a huge amount of time. But on the other hand, if, you have a, if you're really, truly chronically ill with COPD, two, weeks, two, two to three weeks is a long time to wait for a, for, for a, for a checkup, for a kind of visit. I, and, and I think this is a clear, unintended consequence of the Affordable Care Act. Um, in, in a sense, it's made the lives of people with Medicaid, whether you're, you were in the group that got specially expanded or not, harder, because it got harder to get an appointment. What good is it to have an insurance card if you can't, can't see somebody? Uh, I'm, uh, my, the, the rug is being pulled, so I'm, I'm going to skip the limitations, that means. Uh, I just saw that you know, Greg just put up the time thing. Um, so I'll, just, I'll, I'll, skip, I'll go to the conclusion. Uh, I'll just say, well, the, the main thing about, I, I actually, actually, in all honesty, I should do the, the main limitation, which is that this is this focused on fee-for-service Medicaid, and a lot of the market includes managed care. So that th I think that's going to be a real interesting sort of thing to try to think about. Although, on the other hand, it's hard to explain the collapse in the post-period. It, it's not, it's, this managed care trend is a long-running trend that predates the ACA. So it, it, in, in both, and you see managed care, Medicaid, in both me in Texas and in California. So it's hard to use that as an explanation for the results we've seen. Um, so I think, let me just finish, because I, I did get the, the hook pulled, is that the, the Affordable Care Act has done some fantastically good things, but there are some enormous challenges built into the very structure of the law. Uh, it's designed to increase, in, increase insurance coverage, but insurance coverage is not the same thing as access to care. It's not the same thing as actually providing care for the poor. Um, and that's something, something I think we have to think about uh, very carefully in policy going forward. 
uh, especially given the cost of, co of covering some of these populations. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, both John and Jay. Um, I do want to give it, so one of our next panelists is uh, here from the Kaiser Family Foundation, and they have some good, they, had some, they were a source of some of the data there for your stuff, so I want to give a shout out to Kaiser Family Foundation here. Uh, but he's not listening, so he didn't hear. Um, uh, so anyway, it was useless. Um, so I just, I'm just going to have one question, because we ran a bit over. Uh, but, but no, no, it's good. It's, you're it's excited about the re undergrads' research. Come on, this, I'm not going to, we can't pull the hook, uh, pull you out for that. But uh, so, you, uh, John, you talked a bit about the sort of issue of sort of hitting the sweet spot in terms of number of plans from which to choose. You don't want too few. Uh, because then you don't have enough competition, but you also don't want to overwhelm people perhaps with 80 plans because how are they going to make good decisions in a case like that. And one thing there's been more and more work about or more and more discussion about, and this is related to a project that uh, Pietro Tavalde, a PhD student who's here, and I did is what's happening in sort of rural areas. Yes. So rural areas are, and California has a very large uh, number of people living in rural areas, and I don't know what the California specific experience is, my understanding is that in many rural markets, or you know, it's more sparsely populated markets throughout the U.S., we're in a position now where there's only one insurer operating, and uh, and that creates problems for lots of reasons. You don't give people don't get to benefit from choice, and you don't get the the sort of competition. Do you have a sense of how it's going here in California, and or what 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 can we do to to make uh, market outcomes better uh, uh, in those places in California and perhaps nationally? Well, just to validate, you're correct that it's looking ahead to 2017 with the pullout of a couple plans. I think there are about 3,000, a little over 3,000 counties, and 650 of them are going to have a single plan in it as of right now. You know, there could be some people coming back in, some leaving. Uh, in California, we are better. Uh, the Redwood Empire, in particular, is one of the most difficult places to have plans, and with United coming in, we have three at the moment. And, um, you know, I'll say this, Blue Shield and Anthem are pretty good competitors in any region, so there's some competition. We are okay. Um, to maybe answer your question slightly more fully, it's my mind, you've got to have three. I mean, the subsidies are targeted by the second lowest silver plan. So if you just have one and two, there's not much competition. It's when you're playing what I sometimes call musical chairs for those positions that the one who gets edged out above it is the loser, so there's lots of shoving going on to be into the right position. You know, it's, it's market forces at work. Right. And Jade, is it your sense, I mean, you may not have looked at this, you, know, you may not have had the sample size, but do you think sort of when we think about the Medicaid expansion it, in rural areas, do you think it's more important in places, uh, you know, in, in, I don't know exactly, Modoc, Alpine, Butte, these other places, you know, who are, that are more sparsely populated than in places like, let's say, LA or, or San Francisco or San Diego? I mean, it's certainly important in all, in all of those areas, but, uh, but in California, a lot of the poor are actually concentrated in those kind of, uh, you know, mi Fresno, like mi middle of the middle of middle of yeah. California, away from the, away from the big cities. Right. Um, and I, and I think, uh, and that's also, I think, the places. I and mean, we didn't. I can't. I can't. I'm speaking now outside of our data, but I think those are the places that you're, because you know, because we don't have the sample size to say. But right. I think those are the places where you see the biggest challenges in terms of uh, provider coverage. Right. Um, and that's you know, in the same way that. You may be vulnerable to having just one insurer. If you have just like one physician group in a rural area and they don't like the Medicaid, Medi-Cal rates, right, then that, you, that can create problems can too. So in any case, but, um, but yeah, think about those, those places. I, is, uh, I think it's, gonna, it's, a, it's a tough issue yeah. for regulators. So Mark, let me just remind you, California runs what we call a two-plan model. So most counties have a fee-for-service and have at least one managed uh, Medicaid plan. So oh, okay. we're a little bit better than maybe the average. In most places. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, we better be because we have many more people. As a share of our population, we're one in three. We so we're much more than, than most of the U.S. So yeah. we're, uh, uh, only one state, I think, is higher than California. That's New Mexico. New Mexico has a higher share of its population on Medi-Cal. But we're, I think, I think we're, we're number two. Um, okay, so let's open it up for questions uh, from the uh, from the audience. I'm supposed to go with a student first, and I think that's a you, you seem you look student like back there. <laughs> student? No. Is Thank that you. A, I'll, I'll uh, take that as a compliment. <laughs> um, yeah, c couple questions. There's a district court in D.C. that recently ruled that the cost sharing subsidies were illegal, and uh, so not the premium subsidies, but the cost sharing subsidies. I'm just curious your your thoughts on the potential impact of that. 
So. And then more broadly, thinking about, you know, the Republicans have used a lot of rhetoric to say they're going to repeal the ACA. Um, you know, what do you think they could do? And are you guys doing anything to sort of prepare for that? Or is it just too, too early or too uncertain to do much? So uh, on the first, second question, uh, I don't engage in political speculation. I do projection on numbers. So uh, I'll say we'll, we'll see what happens. But on the more important question, which is the cost sharing, uh, certainly that will be appealed. It may be, you know, I don't know the sequence exactly, but I think it goes to a panel in the district court first and then may end up at the Supreme Court. Um, if it were to be upheld, uh, there's about, um, I've only done some back of the envelope, a 10% cost increase uh, that plans who offer these silver plans with the cost sharing subsidies would have to absorb and blend into the cost sharing plan it's a one-time increase. Uh, it is not the end of the world, but it would be painful. Yes. Um, I'm going to get that. We did have a student, I, I, incorrectly. So uh, right over here, Sean, can you can you uh, get to? I was, but you do look like a student. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Think, uh, thank you for uh, for for the opportunity. I, I'm a student from the statistics department. Uh, I'm thinking about maybe are there any micro insurance programs here, like in uh, San Francisco or LA because I know in some less developed com uh, uh, countries there are like insurance companies they cooperate with some like uh, external firms like, like the Bill and Melinda they have found, found some uh, company in Pakistan uh, the companies they are sort of non-profit but run by some insurance companies because they know what the policies are like but the companies are like non-profit company, which can help, definitely helps the people who are uh, not that rich to get very good medical care. Thank you. Yeah. So let me try to begin an answer to that. I know just a little bit about uh, those kinds of uh, companies in other countries, and they tend to focus, I think India has some, on very, very narrow benefits uh, streams. In the U.S., the Affordable Care Act for people who are above that 138% poverty level have 10 essential health plan benefits. So it is a broad spectrum of benefits. And my, I, my recollection on Medicaid is that the minimum Medicaid benefits look much the same as that. So uh, we do have an experiment in process called co-ops. And uh, I plead partial guilt to that. That experiment is not going so well. Right. OK, let's open it up. Uh, Vera, right here in the in front. Yeah. Oh, can we get a bell? Thanks, Bill. Uh, John, I was really surprised to hear the churn numbers that you described, which seemed enormous to me. I mean, if this was employee turnover, we'd fire the CEO. So I'm trying to understand that you must have studied this, and it's a big problem. Uh, can you elaborate on the, on the various causes of this? So let me give you some context. Pre-ACA, I helped start up Humana's approach to an individual market, actually restart it. And the individual market has always been bimodal. There are people that look like me who buy coverage and keep it until they turn eligible for Medicaid. That's about half. Uh, there are the rest of the people before the ACA were students who came off of their coverage at age 22 and people between jobs. And then there would be some small group who, you know, the people between jobs might have lost coverage and then could qualify. So that kind of churn has been common. Uh, this churn adds another component, namely coming up out of Medi-Cal, uh, Medicaid you know, in most states. So it is um, not unexpected. In fact, we've been going through, what, seven years of expansion here? There have been a lot of our folks that we are pretty sure got jobs with employer-sponsored coverage, and the fact that they have them, uh, for me, is fine, but we also are getting some people bubbling up out of Medi-Cal. Okay, uh, more questions? Ed, Sean, can you uh, get right here? Or Jessica, or either? It's like a fly ball. So <laughs> you've taken probably the most complex topic I've ever seen and made it more confusing to me. So I'm going to try to ask you to cut through this board. And I, I apologize. So revealing statistic, uh, in fact, there are more people insured than there were before. That's great. 
But what I didn't realize is that the quality of their care is worse than it was before. No, 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 no. Okay. That's, 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 well, that's so a you, wrong assumption. By that, I mean the statistic that their wait days for the frail people has gone up. So is there a way to measure social benefit from ACA, a simple way of saying, forget the enrollment numbers, which I think can cover up a whole variety of ills. Uh, are we better off? Has the cost of treating the poor gone down? Has mortality improved? Are there some statistics that say we're better off or worse off with ACA uh, than just these micro statistics that you Let me take a couple of stabs at that. Uh, again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit outside my, my data for that to answer your question. So first, have the cost gone up, uh, the cost gone down? When you insure new people, you're going to increase costs. And they yes. have gone up. The total expenditures on the poor have gone up. And I, for me, that's a good thing. Um, I, you know, I think that, that's where we ought to be targeting some of our money. Uh, the question on, on mortality effects, there's a, there's a very famous study called the Oregon Medicaid Experiment. Uh, it, Oregon, uh, in, in, uh, in, a in a different period, expanded their Medicaid coverage, um, but, but they, they, they had a fixed pool of money to, to expand, but they, so, but, they, but they couldn't cover everyone that wanted expand, the expansion. So they randomly assigned some people to the expansion and some people didn't get the expansion. And there's a very, very famous paper by, uh, with, with Amy Finkelstein at MIT. Yeah. Is the, is, is, uh, Former they, supervisor. Yeah, and a yeah. Super, yeah, actually, she's been a CEPA for a while. Um, uh, for a bit, for uh, and and she found that there was no change in mortality rates in the, the the people who were randomized in the year after the expansion. But the people who were randomized to and from this, and this corresponds to a very another very famous randomized experiment in health economics called the Rand Health Insurance Experiment, which finds it's it's just difficult to find average of mortality benefits from insurance coverage in these randomized studies. So. Data, data, data. Yeah. No, don't have it. <laughs> I'm going to take one more question in the back there. Jessica, right in front of you. Professor Barr. Uh, uh, John, you've been around this for a while, and so you remember Harry and Louise. Oh, yes. And Harry I was there Louise, at the time. 1993, Louise is saying to Harry, Harry, if the Clinton plan gets passed, it says here, we're going to have to get our health insurance from one of 52 different government bureaucracies there must be a better way. And of course, they were talking about health alliances, which are almost. So my first question is, do you see the difference in the health benefit exchanges different than the health alliances, or are they fundamentally the same thing? And if they're the same thing, what happened that Harry and Louise were so freaked out in 1993, but now we're taking it as part and parcel of the market? Well, I can tell you that I am an expert to answer that question. Uh, the uh, Clinton administration of the time brought in seven health actuaries to act, uh, act as an actuarial audit team. I was one of them. Um, let, me, let me put it this way. Uh, hopefully, you guys at Stanford learn practical stuff. There was a man named Ira Magaziner who was probably the most brilliant idiot that I have ever known. Uh, <laughs> So to, to answer your question with less uh, humor, uh, the exchanges are much closer to a marketplace. You know, they aren't nearly as good as Expedia or Amazon or something, but we take money and we pass it through. All of the work is done in the private sector by our, in our case, 12 plans. Now, we manage them. Uh, I would suspect any of you who have had a serious encounter with a health insurance plan at some times went, Oh, shit, those blanks. <laughs> and our job is partly to reduce that, to be as a, a middleman in between them. I think we have some degree of success. You know, we, we can be better, believe me. We can definitely be better. Oh, yeah. yeah we, we don't do anything with rate setting or anything. We, we manage, but we don't enforce. Let me put it that way. Okay, great. So uh, please join me in thanking uh, John and Jeff.